So good afternoon. All right, there's a little bit of energy here. This is the like the last session of the, the conference. There's really big names that I'm speaking up against and you guys are here. That's totally awesome. Uh, so thank you for having me. Thank you for coming out to DrupalCon. Uh, how's the conference been for you guys? Great. Yeah? Good stuff? Awesome. Uh, so, uh, hello. My name is Nathan. Um, you might notice that my dad misspelled my name. So here is the rule in my family. Mom picks them, dad misspells them. Uh, and he was consistently misspelling all of our names. So I have a brother named Gordon who also ends with an E-N, as does my Nathan. I have a sister, Adrian, also ends with an E-N. And then a sister, Meredith. My dad tried really, really hard to squeeze in another E-N, but he just couldn't do it. Uh, but he did misspell it. Actually, I don't know the proper way to spell Meredith. I only know the way to spell Meredith the way my sister does, but I know it's wrong. Anyhow, uh, enough of my family history and all about my siblings. Uh, I am a technical community manager at OpsCode. OpsCode is the company behind Chef. I'm also a co-host on the Food Fight Show, which is a podcast. It is, in fact, the podcast where DevOps chefs do battle. Uh, so it's a totally fun podcast, and I, for one, think that everyone in this room should subscribe to that podcast. And in fact, if you subscribe to that podcast, I'll give you a sticker at the end of this talk. In fact, if you don't, I'll still give you a sticker. But uh, I'm also a meetup organizer. I organize a couple of meetup groups in the DC area where I'm based. I'm not really based in DC. I'm based in Annapolis, Maryland, which is nearby. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Nathan Harvey, and if you were fast enough before I click on to the next slide and went to that speaker deck, you can actually get these slides right now. So I'm saving you a question at the end. Where can I get these slides from? You can get them from right there, right now. Go. All right. So OpsCode, who are we? OpsCode, like I said, is the company behind Chef. Chef is an open source configuration management framework. OpsCode is the company behind it. We are not Chef but we are the main contributors, we are the ones that support it. Uh, OpsCode pays people like me to go and talk about Chef and how awesome it is. Uh, so speaking of how awesome it is, just what the heck is Chef? Chef is an automation platform. It's used by developers, systems engineers, sysadmins to model your infrastructure. So you're going to define the way that your infrastructure looks in code. So let's just kind of step back for a minute and talk about your business. Your business is all about applications, and I bet, I would wager a dollar, that everyone in this room, or at least 98% of the people in this room, have an application that's based on Drupal. Am I right? Yeah. yeah? All right. So we've got these applications. These applications make up your business. They run on top of infrastructure. So what do we mean when we talk about infrastructure? Well, with Chef, we really want you to think about your infrastructure in terms of a collection of resources. So your infrastructure is the hardware or the virtual machines, the servers that your Drupal application runs on. Well, how does that Drupal application get there and what are the various components that need to be on that server in order for it to work? These are all of the resources that Chef will help you model and manage. So these resources act together in concert to provide a service and over time that service will evolve. So your configuration is going to change over time. So you start off very simply. I've got this nice little Drupal application. Everything is sitting on one application server. My database is here, my Drupal is here. All is right with the world, everything is beautiful. Why do I need configuration management? It's just one little box, I can handle that, no big deal. But your business starts to scale, you get a lot of good traffic. So you decide, well, we need to improve performance. Let's move the database off of the application server. Let's split it off onto its own dedicated server so we can get better performance out of the database. And let's make sure that we uh, are, have redundancy within our data tier, right? And now our business is getting better and we're getting more and more servers and our application, our infrastructure is really just starting to grow and grow and grow. Uh, and we have to tie all of these various infrastructure components together with configuration so that the load balancer knows which application servers it should talk to. The application servers know which database caches and which database servers they should talk to. This is not a simple problem anymore. This is now a real thing. But of course, your infrastructure is a snowflake. It doesn't look like this here. It looks like this. Actually, that's a lie. Um, 
everyone in the room is a snowflake, and each one of your infrastructures is a beautiful and unique snowflake also. I actually don't know what your infrastructure looks like. Frankly, I don't really care. But Chef will give you the, the primitives, the resources needed to model your infrastructure and manage it over time. Of course, your complexity is just going to continue to evolve because you've got this great application that you're building out. You need something to help solve this, and that's what we call configuration management. So let's say you built all of this infrastructure out, and now, all of a sudden, you have new requirements. So this is a pain, right? I just got a new developer that joined our team. I want to get her up and productive right away. How do I do so? That might take a week in some shops. I need to add new Relic monitoring to my application so I can get much better insight into what's going on. It doesn't need to be New Relic, but I think New Relic is pretty freaking awesome, so if you don't use them, check them out. Uh, add a new module to the development site. I don't want to add this new module to the production site yet, just to the development site. Let's build it, make sure it works the way we want, and then we'll roll it out to production. So how do we do all of this? This all leads to configuration desperation, and Chef solves that problem, but you probably guessed that already. So. Chef is infrastructure as code. What does it mean when we say infrastructure as code? Basically, what we mean with infrastructure as code is that we are going to write code that will model your infrastructure, and it will manage your infrastructure over time. With infrastructure as code, you essentially need three things to rebuild your entire business. You need compute resources, whether those are bare metal or virtual machines, somewhere off in the cloud, whatever, compute resources. You need a backup of your data, and you need your source code repository. Because now that we're treating our infrastructure as code, we are, of course, putting it into a source code repository, just like you do with all of the application code that you write. Right? Right. It all goes into a source code repository. Very important. Uh, so we do this in Chef by writing programs. These programs allow us to abstract the details of the infrastructure away, and really model what that infrastructure looks like. Programs also allow us to build up our infrastructure in modular pieces. So within these programs, we have a declarative interface to our resources. So those resources, again, were things that we saw a couple of slides back, things like users or packages or files, directories, things like this. Within our programs, we're going to define our policy. So what should this application server, what should this server have on it? What should the characteristics of this server be? We will specify what, but not how. And we'll look at that in just a second. But as an example, we may say that we want a package installed. We won't tell or we won't say in our program exactly how to install that package. Should you use yum? Should you use apt? We'll just say that the package has to be installed. That is our policy. And then Chef works in a pull, not a push model. So essentially what you have is on each one of your servers, on each one of your nodes in your infrastructure, there's a Chef client running. It will wake up on a periodic basis, check in with the Chef server, and say, hey, what's my policy? The Chef server will send down that policy, and the Chef client will bring that node into line with the policy. We'll see some examples of that here in a bit. Okay, so here's what those programs might look like. Uh, of course, they don't have the nice, pretty drop shadows when you write them in your text editor. Well, I don't know, maybe your editor does. But uh, So here's what they look like. We've got first a resource that's a package, a package resource, Apache 2. So again, we're not saying how to install Apache 2. We're saying that this package must be on this system. Next up, we have a template. So we've installed this package. This package exists on the system. Now I'm going to write out a template file, some Apache configuration. And then finally, I have a service resource. And in this service resource, I'm saying that I want this service to be enabled and started. So let me just break down what this is doing. The first thing that it does when it says, when the chef client sees package Apache 2, it's going to inspect the system that it's running on and say, does the Apache 2 package exist here? Has it been installed? If it has, it's just going to move on and go on to the template. If it has not yet been installed, it will install Apache 2 and then it will move on to the template. The next thing that it sees here is the template resource. And in our template resource, we're saying, I want to manage this file, etsy apache2, apache2.conf. And in it, 
I want to specify some content, and I'm going to use a template file to specify what that content is going to be. We're not going to look at the template right now, but you can imagine that it's a template, right? It has some variable substitution. In fact, we're going to send down a variable called allow override. How many of you have said an HTTP, you know, allow override within their Apache Conf before? Yeah, just about everybody, right? And so we're going to say, just allow override, we're going to set that to all. We'll say that as a variable, and that'll end up in the template. And then I'll come back to that next line that notifies there. So the template is now written out. Of course, before the template gets written, the first thing that Chef will do is verify that the, the file already exists on the system. And if it does, it's going to inspect the contents of that file and determine does it need to make a change to that file or not. If that file is already in line with policy, Chef will leave that file alone. And then the last thing that it comes to here is the service. And we have a service named Apache 2. And it has two actions that we're sending to it. We want to enable it and start it. So enable it says when the server reboots, Apache should come up automatically. And I want to start Apache. So again, Chef is going to inspect the system and say, hey, is Apache 2 already in check config or whatever system you're using to make sure that things come up when your system reboots? If it is, I take no action. Is Apache running right now? If so, I take no action. Otherwise, I will start it for you. And then if we go back to the template, in the instance when the template contents uh, require a change on the file system, it will do that last, line, that last line there that notifies. So the template, if it changes, will send a notification to the service called Apache 2, and it will say, you need to reload. And so what happens is, if the contents of that file, that configuration file change, it will send, it will tell Apache 2 to reload its configuration. This is good that it, we have this subscription model or this notification model. The reason this is good is, as I mentioned, Chef Client will run on a periodic basis. You don't want to reload Apache every time Chef Client runs, only if that file changed and you actually need to. So these resources, we put them, we write them into programs that we call recipes. You know, we had this name for our product called Chef, and so we really stick with this metaphor. Everything around Chef is going to be like kitchen related. So we take these resources, we write programs, we call those programs recipes. We package those programs together with template files into cookbooks, uh, template files, and a bunch of other things. So we really take this cooking metaphor and just kind of run with it except when we don't, because sometimes we don't and we call things stuff like LWRP and everybody has an LWRP in their kitchen, right? No? Me either. But uh, yeah, so that's what recipes and cookbooks are. The other cool thing about search, uh, about Chef, is that you can search. So Chef, in addition to having this policy about what your infrastructure should look like, also has a searchable index of the current state of your infrastructure. So we can do things like discover which nodes should fall behind our, our load balancer. We can look up IP addresses, all kinds of stuff. So here's another example of some recipe code. And in this one, in the first line here, what we're doing is we're executing a search against our chef server. I'm saying, hey, chef server, what are all of the nodes that have the role awesome site assigned? And if you're still paying attention, you'll notice that there's a problem on that first line. But I assure you, the code in the slide compiled just fine. Uh, but I am missing a double quote there at the end. Anyhow, so we search for any nodes, any servers that have this role of awesome site. We gather those all together and pass that list down to a template. So you, you see that there in variables, pool members is pool members dot unique. So it's Maybe there are four, uh, four web servers, four Drupal application servers behind our load balancer. Chef server knows about these, returns those as results. And then in our template, as we configure our load balancer, we can point to each one of those four web servers that are sitting behind the load balancer. Now, if I were to come along and spin up another application server, the next time Chef Client runs on the load balancer, it will automatically discover it and start sending traffic to it. By the same token, if, uh, if I were to take a web server and shut it down, the load balancer would also recognize that and stop sending traffic to it. This is so that when this, you know, your application infrastructure 
becomes this. We add one more tier or one more node to our application tier. All of this can happen automatically. We can stitch this guy into our entire infrastructure. And if you stop and count the resources, you'll see that there are at least 11 resources that need to change through the addition of just one node. So with one command, we can spin up this node, get it configured as an application server or as a Drupal server for us as part of our infrastructure, and tie it into our entire infrastructure. It's as easy as that. So let's talk a little bit more specifically about deploying Drupal with Chef and the process that you might go through to do that. And I'd just like to step back for a second and talk about some components that are involved with a Chef-managed infrastructure. You have essentially three big areas that you'll be concerned with. On the bottom here in the middle, this is your workstation. This is where you write the policy that your infrastructure should follow. This is where you write your recipes and your cookbooks and so forth. Of course, this is also where you have your repository, your Git repository, or Subversion or Perforce, whatever source code control you use, as long as you're using source code control, which we're all doing. I think we've already established that. Uh, so you put all of that on your workstation. And then above and to the left over here, we have the chef server. So that's where we're going to take the policy, the cookbooks that we write, we're actually going to publish them from our workstation up to the chef server. So the chef server has a couple of roles. One is that it will house all of our cookbooks, all of our policies for us. It also has that searchable index of information about our infrastructure. And then off on the right, we have the nodes. So these are the individual machines within your infrastructure. Now these, as I mentioned earlier, I think, could be bare metal machines, they could be VMs that are running locally, they could be cloud instances off on EC2 or Rackspace or wherever. Wherever you can run a server, that's where it'll be. So let's talk about our workflow for building out a Drupal site. First, we're gonna build Drupal locally. We'll deploy a Drupal application to EC2 and then we're just gonna iterate over that over time. So let's start with local development. We start off first with a Git repository. Now, I know I'm kind of beating this dead horse, right? Everything has to be in source code control. Just a quick question, how many of you have ever um, gone to a command line and done something like cp foo.txt space foo.txt.old? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not source code control, right? That doesn't count. Uh, and if you get like super fancy about it and turn that into foo.txt.date timestamp, still not source code control, no. You have to actually use a real source code control repository. In fact, if you're not using a source code control repository, you shouldn't even listen to anything else I say about Chef. You should go to like learngit.com and learn Git and start using that right now. All right, so we'll get our repository set up. Then we need a virtual machine because, like I said, we want to build this locally. It doesn't make sense for me to build Drupal locally on an OSX platform when I'm going to deploy on Ubuntu. Let me deploy and build locally on the same platform that I'm going to deploy to in production. And then finally, we need Chef on my workstation. So I need this super awesome tool called Knife, which comes with Chef. And I also need a Chef server to be uh, in the mix here. All right, so we set up our Git repository. Everyone's done something like this before, right? So make a directory, do a git init. Next up, we're going to build a VM. How many have used Vagrant before? All right, not enough of you. It's not as bad as not using version control, but trust me, you wanna go check out Vagrant. Go to vagrantup.com. This is what you want to do to manage all of your VMs locally from this, from this moment onward. All right, so with Vagrant, you can deploy a local virtual machine. It makes it super easy. And in fact, as the tagline says, Vagrant will change how you work. All right, so Vagrant essentially is a nice wrapper around Oracle's virtual box. Now, those of you that have been using Vagrant for a long time and are like up to speed on where Vagrant is going are gonna be like, yo, Nathan, it does a lot of other than just virtual box, but that's cool. We're just gonna talk about virtual box today. So with Vagrant, we can configure a Vagrant file. And this is essentially all that we have to do to define a virtual machine. So I'm going to, in this virtual, or in this Vagrant file, I'm creating a new virtual machine. It's going to run on my laptop. I'm gonna give it a host name. I'm going to give it a box. A box is basically the baseline image that you're using for this machine. 
And then you can also do fun things with networking. So for example, in that last or second to last line there, you'll see that I'm forwarding a port. So port 80 on the VM, I can get to, I can access from my local machine via port 8080. In other words, if I go to localhost colon 8080, I'm actually looking at the VM. And we'll see that in a minute. Okay, then we need to install Chef, right? So we've got our repository, we've got a virtual machine running, let's get Chef going. If you go onto the ops code website, you'll find the place where you can install Chef. We need to install the client. It's going to have drop down boxes as shown here. So you'll set up your operating system and things like this. And it will give you something that will install Chef. Now you might want to know, well, what is that something? Uh, and the answer of course is it depends. If you're on a Windows box, that something it's going to give you is an MSI. If you're on a Mac or an Ubuntu or Linux box, it's going to give you something, uh, a, a curl, a URL that you can curl and pipe into Bash because that's how we all love to install software, right? So anyhow, uh, what that installs though is everything that you need for Chef. So Chef, as you might know, or maybe have sussed out by now, the Chef client and the recipes that you write are all in Ruby. Now, you may or may not have Ruby installed on your machine, and if you're like, yeah, I'm on a Mac and it comes with Ruby, then you don't actually have a good Ruby installed on your machine, so that kind of sucks. But don't worry, you don't have to worry about all the pain of installing Ruby and like dealing with RBNV or RVM or which one of those version managers should I use or Cheruby, what's going on? Ruby, Ruby's just nutballs crazy, right? So with Chef, uh, through ops code in this installer, we'll install a Ruby for you. It'll be off in its own place and Chef will use that Ruby. So you get everything, everything that you need here with uh, this install. Then you need a Chef server. So you're just getting started with Chef, I imagine, because probably some of you here actually never done anything with Chef. I will tell you the best way to get started with Chef is to use hosted Chef as your server. The reason that I think that's best, number one, you don't really need to concern yourself with how to configure and set up another server, although setting up and configuring a Chef server is relatively painless. But the other part about using Hosted Chef is you can use it for free for up to five nodes, and then you really don't need to worry about that server at all. You just point to ours, ops code runs it, you don't pay us, manage five nodes for free, learn Chef. When you're ready, you can start paying us some money. It's totally cool. We'll totally take your money. You can manage more nodes that way, or we can install it locally, or you can just switch out and go to the free open source version. It's all good. But Hosted Chef is the way to start learning Chef. So now we need to register our virtual machine, that virtual box that we created. We need to register it with our Chef server. So I went and created a Chef account, and now I'm back in my Vagrant file. And within Vagrant, we have these things called provisioners. So Vagrant knows how to provision the boxes that it's managing with things like Chef, uh, using the Chef client or Chef Solo. It knows how to provision things with Puppet. It knows how to provision things with Bash scripts, but who would ever just provision with Bash scripts because no. Um, but so what we do with Chef client, we have to tell it the server that we're talking to and give it some authentication credentials. So we set that up within our Vagrant file. And then I run this command Vagrant provision. And what Vagrant Provision will do is go into the machine, that virtual machine, and run the Chef client for us, which again is going to wake up, say, hey, Chef Server, here I am. What does my policy look like? Chef Server right now will say, dude, I don't know anything about you. You have an empty run list. You have no policy, but now you're registered with me. So that's all good. So with that, we've basically set up all of the components that we need to get our baseline Drupal local development out. We've got a local virtual machine that's running. We've got our Git repository. We've uh, got our Chef server set up. We've got Chef installed on our workstation. Everybody's talking to one another. Now it's time to get into the real meat. So now we need to write some cookbooks. How are we actually going to manage this infrastructure? What does our policy look like? Well, we have a couple of options. We can go to the community site, community.opscode.com, and download some cookbooks. We're going to write one of our own cookbooks, and then we're going to take all of these cookbooks that we've written or downloaded and upload them to the Chef server. So that's kind of our next three steps that we're going to do. So on the community site at community.opscode.com, you can go there right now and find over 950 cookbooks. 
these cookbooks cover all kinds of different things that you will want to configure in your infrastructure. And since there are 950, all kinds of things that you will never want anywhere near your infrastructure. But, you know, there's a nice overlap. We'll find the ones that you want. So these are database cookbooks, process management, programming languages, everything that you could possibly want. The cool thing about these cookbooks and the community site is that it allows sysadmins and systems engineers and developers who have been working with these tools for years and years to sort of codify that tribal knowledge and put that into a cookbook that you can then share with other folks. So I don't really know anything about installing PostFix, but I can go to the community site and grab a cookbook that will do that for me and will manage it for me. I can learn a lot about the management of PostFix by looking at that and gain wisdom from others within this tribe. They're also great for reference, just for that same purpose. You may decide that you don't actually want to use the cookbook off of the community site, but it's a great guide to help you write your own cookbook also. All right, so we are going to download a bunch of cookbooks off of the community site. That's all happening in the background now. So uh, let's also write one of our own cookbooks. We're going to write a cookbook called Awesome Site, because of course every site we build is awesome which actually makes it a really bad name because every site we build is awesome. So which one is this? So anyhow, we're gonna do a knife, cookbook create awesome site. This is going to create a directory structure for me that has everything that belongs in a cookbook. One of those things, one of the files it's, it will create is a recipe, a recipe file for us. Now, our recipes are the programs that we write. As I mentioned earlier, these are modular. So the first thing that we're going to do is actually include another recipe in our recipe. And the recipe that we're going to include is called Drupal. That is a cookbook that we're downloading off of the community site. And then within our recipe, we're going to create a new web application. We're going to name it Drupal. It's going to have a template. And we're going to specify the doc root, the server name, and some server aliases. Now I've highlighted a couple of things here because they're kind of funky. This doc root node Drupal dir, what is that? And the server aliases node FQDN, what, what is all of this stuff? Well, the cool thing about uh, this is that it is data. And with Chef, it allows you to separate your data from your policy. So our policy states that our document, our web server should have a document root. But the actual location of that document root is data, and it's separated out from the recipe. Same thing with our Apache server alias. It should be the fully qualified domain name of this server, and maybe a couple of other things. But either way, it's separated out from the recipe. The nice thing about this separation is that it allows us to change things in different environments. It allows us to model our infrastructure in a, a much more reusable way, so we can reuse these recipes over and over again. So where does that data come from? There are a bunch of places that Chef allows you to pull this data from. You can pull this data from attributes, from these things that we call data bags, which have a cousin called encrypted data bags, and then you can also pull them from search. So let's just dig into each one of those. We'll look at attributes, data bags, and then search. So what are attributes? Attributes specify details about a node. They're defined in a number of different ways or a number of different places. You can define them, or they're defined as the state of the node. You can define them in your cookbooks, and then in other things that I haven't really mentioned yet called roles and environments. So within, uh, within Chef, we have this tool called OHI which admittedly is not following with our kitchen metaphor, but is a super cute name. You have to admit that, right? So Ohi has this super cute name and it's super awesome. If you have Chef installed locally right now and you run Ohi at a command line, you will see that it spits back a JSON document full of all kinds of details about your system. Details like what operating system are you running? How much RAM do you have available on the machine? So all of these facts that you can get about your machine. This is super important because you can use this in your recipes to help drive your policy. This is data that can drive policy. And then we can also specify attributes in our cookbooks, our roles, and our environments. These all are different places at which we can set attribute data. 
Now, there's an, these provide an extremely flexible mechanism for configuration. It's flexible because you have the ability to override things at various levels throughout your infrastructure. So for example, in our cookbook, I might say that I want my default Drupal modules to be views and web form. That's my default. But then I, I can have an environment, maybe it's my development environment, where I want to test out a new module. If I add or change the default attributes to Drupal modules, views, web form, and token, that new module will be installed in my development environment, but won't be installed in my production environment yet, not until I introduce it there. But I don't need to change my recipe at all. I just rerun Chef Client and that module will be installed. So this is a, a great illustration of how you can separate the data. The data here are the list of modules that we want installed. We have a function or a recipe code that will install any modules that we've specified. Okay, so that's how we get our attribute data. So we looked at OHI, which is our system data, the state of the node. We've got attribute data from cookbooks and so forth. And then we have data bags. Data bags are global bits of data stored as JSON that we can use anywhere in our infrastructure. So it doesn't matter, say, if this server is in production or staging or test or development, I want to log into it because I'm Nathan and I'm like the admin dude. And so I can put my user information into a data bag and then I can have a recipe that will go and search the user's data bag, find all of the users in my organization and create users for them on the system. The cool thing about data bags is that I can also encrypt those data bags. So a data bag you might use to store, say, the admin's username and password for your site or for your database. Well, you are using source code repository, but you don't want to check in the password in the clear. So you can actually encrypt your data bags and then check in the encrypted value of that password into your source code repository. And then you, uh, you know, have some better assurance that you know, someone looking at your source code repository can't actually figure out what that password is. Assuming, of course, you didn't check in your key that decrypts it into your source code repository because that would be wrong. All right. So we can get data from uh, data bags. We can also get data from search. Same thing that we saw earlier. This is, a, in fact, it's the same code, just without all the highlighting. So we can search our infrastructure and say, hey, what are the application servers that should be behind the load balancer? Or maybe you're one of the application servers and you need to point to the database server. But I don't have to specify in advance what is the database server. I don't have to like give it a special name, like this is db01.prod.foo.com. I don't care what it's named, I can just ask the chef server who is the primary database server in this environment. And I'll write that into my database connection string. Okay, so we've written some cookbooks, we've downloaded some from the community site. We got a little introduction to attribute data and sort of how we can abstract that out from our policy. So now we need to upload those cookbooks to our Chef server. So we're going to use Knife to do so. Knife is the command line tool that you will use to interact with Chef and your infrastructure from your workstation. So we do this Knife cookbook upload dash A. And you guys are such Chef experts now, I bet you can tell me what the dash A means. Yes, all, all right, see? You guys are rocking it. All right, so we've got our infrastructure ready to go. All of our bits are right where they need to be. We've written our policy, our cookbooks on our workstation. We've published them up to our, our server. We've got a virtual machine ready to go. We're just missing one thing. How do we tie the virtual machine to those cookbooks, to that policy that we've written? The way that we do that is through what we call a run list. A run list is the ordered list of roles or recipes that should be run on a node or applied to the node. So the run list really represents the policy for your server. So when the chef client executes, the chef client runs on the nodes, on the servers that you're managing, it will wake up, it will ask the chef server, hey, what does my policy look like? Give me my run list. The chef server will send that run list down to the chef client, and then the chef client will take whatever action is necessary to bring that node, that server, into compliance with that policy. Now, whatever action is necessary, maybe 
takes no action because it's already in line with policy. Or it may be it hasn't done anything yet, so it has to do a whole lot of stuff. Or maybe it's just a small change, anywhere in between. So here's what our run list might look like. We might have a database server, and we might have a web server. And so when the chef client wakes up on each one of those, it'll say, hey, what does my run list look like? And for the web server, it's going to say, yeah, you need NTP, OpenSSH, you need Apache, and you need Drupal. Go and make sure that you have all of these things and that they're configured properly. And then on the database server, you need NTP, OpenSSH, and you need MySQL or MySQL. Chef doesn't really care how you pronounce it, actually. As long as you spell it properly, it's good. So these policies will come down to the nodes. The nodes will inspect themselves in relation to the policy and make sure that they are in line with that policy. So we will specify that run list in our Vagrant file by going into the Vagrant file and in the provision block, we can just do a chef.addRecipe awesome site. So we created our awesome site recipe. I specify that run list there in the Vagrant file. I run Vagrant provision. And now I can go to my local host on port 8080 and Drupal is there. So I had nothing before. I had just a blank VM. I run Vagrant provision and now I've got Drupal installed for me with all of the modules that I've specified and so forth. So now I have a local development environment that I can use. So I've got Drupal running on Ubuntu which is what I'm going to deploy to eventually when I get to production, so this is great. What are my next steps? Well, I can share this Vagrant file with other people on my team. So now, uh, we hired a new developer. I give her a Vagrant file and access to the appropriate things. She can go to her command line and run Vagrant up, and she's got the VM that's configured exactly the same way that my VM was configured. We no longer get into this place or this state where the sysadmin like, logs in and makes a little tweak makes a little fix, solves a little problem on the server that no one remembers and it gets forgotten about because that's now all in our source code repository. So we've got this Vagrant file, we've got a local development environment, we work on this Drupal machine, we're happy with it, we're ready to get it into production. So now we're ready for our de production deploy. In my example, I'm going to use Amazon's EC2 for our initial deploy, but we could really deploy this anywhere you want. So maybe you have your own data center or colo space at a data center, or you like rack space over EC2 or Linode or whomever, it doesn't matter. We have the ability to deploy there. The cool thing is that we will use the same cookbooks as we built in our development environment to deploy to EC2. So without changing any of our code, we just go, drop down to the command line and run this command. So Knife is, uh, has a plugin for EC2. What this plugin allows us to do is awesome things like launch instances off on EC2. So I run this command, Knife EC2 server create. I'm going to pass it a run list. So I want you to create a server. It should have the awesome site recipe applied to it. I want it to be an M1 medium. The AMI that I want you to use is this, and I want the node name to be EC2 Drupal, or whatever you like. I hit enter, and here's what happens. Knife will contact EC2 and say, hey, I need a new instance of this AMI. That instance will be launched. Knife will then SSH into that machine and install Chef on that machine for you using the same installer that I just showed you earlier. So it's going to install Ruby for you, install Chef. It will then run the Chef client. So it will check in with the Chef server. It'll say, hey, in this case, because we're just launching that server, it's going to say, hey, Chef server, I'm new. It's great to meet you. My policy, my run list is awesome site. I want you to know that. I want you to give me whatever I need for that. So the Chef server will send down all of those cookbooks. They all come down to that node, it executes through them, and bam. We now have Drupal running and configured the exact same way as it was in development. It's configured that exact same way in production. So we are now at the state where we have a local virtual machine for development running Drupal and a production instance on EC2. And these two were configured identically. And now if I need to make a change, I can make a change in one place. I can promote that change, push it up to my chef server, and each one of these environments can change as appropriate. So that's great. We got like this initial Drupal install done, but really chef is more than about just provisioning. 
it's really about allowing you to manage your code, manage your infrastructure over time, right? So think back to the beginning where we had all those nodes popping up. So what, what, what might we do next? We might move the database off to another server, add a load balancer, add some monitoring, something like that. Tons of things that we can do and now we can start to iteratively improve and continuously improve our infrastructure much the same way that you would an application. So a little bit more about Chef. Chef is this super awesome framework, but outside of that, there is this huge ecosystem that's built up around Chef, and that ecosystem involves this amazing community that is continually building awesome tools for Chef and really expanding the scope of Chef and what the things that you can do with Chef. Recently, some of the biggest things that have come out of the community have been uh, pretty dramatic advances in the way that you can test your infrastructure code. How many of you have done TDD before, or test-driven development, or heard of it? A couple of you. You can do the same now with your infrastructure code, in large part because of community contributions to the Chef ecosystem. We can actually write, follow a TDD process as we build our infrastructure code. So the community is super awesome. Uh, Chef, of course, is open source, and I'd love to have you commit to Chef, right? Come help us make Chef even better. It's Apache 2 software license. We have over 1,400 individuals and over 200 companies right now that are contributors to Chef. These are where we have our development repositories on GitHub and OpsCode and then OpsCode-Cookbooks. The cool thing, one of the cool things that we do, the thing that I think is super awesome, um, when we get a patch from a community member, we host regular Google Hangouts, probably two or three a week, where the Ops Code engineering team will get into a Google Hangout, we stream it to YouTube, and invite anyone who wants into that Hangout, and we will do code review on each one of the tickets that are up for review, each one of those submissions that have come in. It's a great way to manage the open source contributions. As a contributor, you can be in that Hangout and know exactly what the feedback is that our engineering team is giving on your pull request. And maybe during that Hangout, there's a minor change you want to make, get it done, and it gets submitted, fixed is accepted. It's super awesome. Uh, if you're brand new to Chef, or are looking for a, a better way to manage your open source project, I definitely recommend Google Hangouts. All right, so getting started on your own, where do you go? A great place to start is learnchef.com. This site is really geared towards helping you get Chef up and running on your local workstation with Vagrant as quickly as possible. You can basically spend a lunch break, maybe a little bit longer, maybe a little bit less, depending on how long your lunch break is and how hungry you were that day, for knowledge, of course, uh, you get Chef up and running. And then there's the docs site, docs.opsco.com, and then lists.opsco.com. Of course, uh, we're also on IRC all the time. Super helpful, super friendly room. It's Pound Chef on Freenode. All right. We are uh, doing pretty good on time, so we will have time for questions, but I want to wrap up and give you a special offer unique for you. So you really, really need to seriously consider, uh, actually you probably just need to move to a place where you are managing your infrastructure as code. The benefits you will realize are tremendous and include each one of the things here on the list. One of the, the, the things on the list though, I'm not going to read you the list, but I do want to highlight the last bullet on the list. When you start managing your infrastructure as code, you will be happy. The sysadmins and the people that today manage your infrastructure, they are not happy. They might think they're happy, but get them using Chef and they will understand, or get the, uh, it doesn't even need to be Chef, frankly. Get them managing their infrastructure as code. Start managing your infrastructure as code, you will be so happy. Gone are the days of handcrafted servers. We are not Etsy, we are running businesses, we are professionals. Uh, that's not to say that the people that handcraft things and sell them on Etsy aren't professionals, but it's not how we should be building our infrastructure. It's not how IT should run. We really need to look at automation. You will wake up one day, if you're not using Chef yet or managing your infrastructure's code, one day you will wake up and realize that 
the way that I make a change is by a git commit. And that is super powerful. You will never look back and you will, well, you will look back and you'll be like, man, it's like those days when I didn't use any version control and I was CPing food, a food.old, man, bad times. But this will really make you happy. I'd also like to uh, send out a couple of thanks, a couple of shout outs here. Uh, Promat Source actually, uh, they gave a talk yesterday about Chef and how they're using Chef in their organization. So if you don't know Promat, you should uh, check out their booth if the exhibit hall is still open. If not, a couple of the guys are here uh, and maybe even Michelle is still here. Um, but Promat is a Drupal shop and they use Chef and it's awesome. And in fact, Will, who gave a talk, who was one of the presenters yesterday, wrote a Drupal cookbook and since we all love to curl stuff to bash, because that's how we roll, if you go and curl this bit.ly URL and pipe it to bash, because what harm could that do? And then, and then do a vagrant up, trust me, it's gonna be fine, right? And then do a vagrant up, guess what? You get a Drupal environment running in virtual box, managed by vagrant, managed by chef. Boom, one command line and you're done, it's awesome. Uh, yes. And then Marius also, who wrote uh, the Drupal cookbook that's currently on the community site uh, and whose code I've used, actually I've used all of this code. It's good times. And now for the special offer. So, if after, I don't know how many days of DrupalCon, your head is not full of new knowledge and you're interested in joining me on a road trip down to OSU, you can spend eight hours with me tomorrow talking about nothing but chef. We'll do hands-on, it's a free intro workshop. It's free if you register by nine o'clock tonight and you register at this URL. Half of what I just said is true. The part about it being free is totally true. You also have to register by nine, but it's not just for DrupalCon attendees. It's free for anyone. So you can tell your friends, tell your sysadmin that didn't get to come to the conference, who's sitting at home and is all bummed out like, man, you got to go to DrupalCon, I had to sit home and manage Nagios alerts. You can say, dude, let's solve that. Go get some chef training. I'll, I'll handle the pager for you today. Uh, thank you. That's, uh, that's my presentation. All right, so we've got about 14 minutes for questions. Um, and you guys know the drill. Yeah, okay, so here we go. Um, I have two questions. The first is I have written uh, probably about one and a half lines of Ruby in my life. Awesome. And I'm wondering how much Ruby I need to know to get started with Chef. Okay, so that's a great question. How much Ruby do you need to know to get started with Chef? The first question I have to you is, did I shared some code. Could you kind of follow along? I've looked into Chef and that's why I started learning Ruby, but All I've right. probably written about one and a half lines of Ruby. Cool. That worked. So, on the docs page, on docs.opsco.com, there's a link that's called Just Enough Ruby for Chef. Mm -hmm. Totally check that out. Okay. And also at the bottom of that, there are links to other places where you can go to learn a lot more Ruby than you need for Chef. The short answer is you don't really need to know Ruby to get started with Chef, but as you start to really dig into Chef and really start to, you know, kind of stretch outside of the bounds of, say, a community cookbook, mm -hmm. you're going to need, you're going to want to learn some Ruby, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, and the second question is, uh, I went to a boff yesterday on Vagrant and uh, yeah. virtualization. And if anybody was at the boff that's uh, here, I might want to connect with you briefly. Just, uh, But anyways, um, one of the questions that sort of uh, came up quite a number of times, especially with the people who haven't worked as much with it, uh, and there's people who knew a bit more, is like the provisioner that works inside of Vagrant. Yes. Should you use Chef or should you use Puppet? As yes, general, you should. The general consensus seemed to be flip a coin, right? And I was wondering if you see maybe in the future maybe some convergence of those two projects because they seem to be geared at the same kind of solution. Right. But so, they're like one's over here and one's over there and they're totally different. Yeah, and so they sort of have a history also. Um, I don't want to bore you with a history lesson, but sure. like Puppet was first and then there was Chef. Um, and before Puppet, there was CF Engine. And so actually a very big CF Engine user slash consultant was like, I'm kind of tired of CF Engine. I'm going to go start this other thing called Puppet for his reasons. And then there was a Puppet guy who was doing the same thing and was like, yeah, I'm done with Puppet. I'm going to go start Chef, right? Mm -hmm. So they've all kind of 
sort of standing on each other's shoulders, if you will. Uh, and they definitely have different approaches, um, but at the end of the day, they solve essentially the same problem. I think that uh, you need to really kind of sort out where do you want to go with managing infrastructure as code, and then looking at your end goal, which of the tools is going to work best for you and your team to get you from where you are today to there? So the short answer is, yeah, man, flip a coin. Right, but do you think that, <laughs> do you think Puppet and Chef might unify somehow in the future? Do you, is that possible? I would, um, I would like, uh, I don't know what's bigger than surprised if that happened, right? Okay. So I, I would be yeah. beyond that. Yeah, all right. Right, yeah, okay. I, I, that's not going to happen. Okay, okay, well, thank you. You bet, thank you. Uh, right, that's not gonna happen, right? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, how do you manage uh, duplicate submissions to the community cookbooks? Is there one true cookbook on the community and if you want something to get different, build your own or are there more than one way to do it in the community that you can download? Yes, so, that's a great question. Um, so let me tell you about the community site. It's super awesome because anyone can upload a cookbook. And let me tell you about the community site. It's really terrible because anyone can upload a cookbook, right? And so what this leads to is varying quality of the cookbooks that you find there. Um, here's the thing, right? So uh, you really, I mean, this, this is true for so many things, cookbooks not the least of which. You should never go to a website and download a package that is going to do something on your system and run it in your system, especially not your production system, before you understand what that thing is actually going to do, right? Uh, and I think that potentially cookbooks like fall into the like super cautious area because now I'm managing my infrastructure and I certainly don't want to just run that in production willy-nilly, what's gonna happen, right? It's running as roots, yeah, it'll be fine, I'm sure. Yeah, uh, so uh, there is, um, so your question though was duplicates, duplicate submissions, is there a one true cookbook? Because this cookbook is at slash Drupal, does that mean that is the blessed Drupal cookbook? It does not mean that at all, it means that that is the one that got the slash Drupal namespace first. Uh, sometimes that means, yeah, the community totally agrees that that's the right one, but sometimes it's like, no, there's actually this one over on GitHub that you should use. Uh, it's a challenge that we face as a community. It's kind of a, uh, I don't know, in some ways it's a nice challenge to have, right? Because there's so many great cookbooks and there, there is, it with every one of these things, many, many different ways to do that thing, right? And some cookbooks are built for like, super flexibility, so like an ops code professional consultant can go in and say like, yeah man, you can use this cookbook at this site, this site, this site, and I just tweak some knobs and it works perfectly for you. Maybe you don't need that flexibility in your infrastructure, you want something that's a little bit simpler. Yeah, because I've seen, um, obviously I'm wearing a Puppet shirt, but I'm looking into using Puppet and on their forge they have, you know, a thousand or so modules, but they have like five things that do the same thing. I, s I did see that you had like a five-star rating system, so I wasn't sure if there was... I would not trust that rating system. <laughs> okay. In fact, it, it should absolutely go away. So if you, if you look anywhere near at the numbers, right, in addition to the five-star rating system, we also show you the number of downloads. If you look at like the top downloaded cookbook, which is I think the MySQL cookbook or the Apache cookbook, it's got like in the tens of thousands of downloads and like a hundred ratings. So yeah, don't, do not trust those stars at all. Hi. Hey, you uh, described um, setting up a local virtual machine using the Drupal recipe and yes. in there you, um, you specify the modules that you want on your Drupal site which makes sense for setting up a new site um, and then you kind of set it up in production. What I'm wondering is typically in a production environment you're not going to be initializing a new Drupal uh, Drupal site, you'll be putting, like, you want you to check out your code from your code repository to the, so sure. is that is that done, is that done slightly differently than with a different kind of recipe, or is that, or would you not use the Drupal recipe actually in your live environment, because you don't really want to initialize a new 
Right. So what the, the Drupal recipe that I have will do is get Drupal installed for you unless it's already installed. Now we have other resources. In fact, there's a resource called the deploy resource. With the deploy resource, that's likely what you would use with a Drupal application. You can essentially say, this is where I want my application files to go and this is the repository that you should pull them from. And then one of the bits of data there that you can specify is the revision that you want. So you could do something like in your environment file, set a data attribute that says the, in, the revision is the production branch or this SHA. And then I can easily and continually, you know, just update that data. And then every time the chef client runs, it'll just suck down the latest, you know, or whatever that revision is that I'm now pointing at, it will pull that down for you. So this, this is admittedly like the simple, we'll show you a couple of PowerPoint slides in an hour and it, it, it's magic. And actually it's just PowerPoint slides, so you have to trust me, right? <laughs> But it is, it's awesome. It's not magic, it is awesome, not magic. Uh, so when it comes to actually deploying your application, you're gonna do a little bit more in your cookbooks and in sure. your recipes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, can you specify in cookbooks um, uh, if you want something compiled a certain way um, and adding uh, uh, modules or extensions to PHP, for instance, or something like that? Absolutely. So uh, basically anything that you would do at the command line, you can absolutely do within Chef. And of course, you don't have to do it with the command line. You have this abstraction layer on top of that. So one of the things that this recipe that I did, uh, it installed not only PHP on this machine for me, but all of the extensions that were required to get Drupal up and running. And let's say I had another module that had another extension that was required. I could have in my recipe, oh, yeah, we'd need to include this other PHP module or this pair package or whatever. Yeah. Great, thank you. You bet. Hi, great Hi. talk. Thanks. Uh, awesome. Um, I'm wondering if Chef can sort of learn about the current development system you're on, if you like it and it's going well, and like sort of use it as a clone to push out new uh, instances of that node. Does that make sense? Um, there was a command that showed like uh, the resources of it and stuff. Is there one that mm -hmm. will kind of say, I want to get my current PHP config and my SQL, everything I need for Drupal, uh, kind of reverse engineer what I have and then right. have a new cookbook per se and I can make a clone? Is gotcha. That, is that gotcha. Possible? Yeah, so there, there's nothing in Chef that will like say, go inspect a system and turn this unmanaged system into a set of cookbooks that I can then go and manage a system with. Is that, I think that's kind of what you're after, right? Yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah. that's exactly what you're after, right? That's beautiful. Uh, there's, there's a gem, uh, I think it's called Blueprints, that, will, that uh, claims to do that for you. And it can, it's, it's like, I don't care, I'll give you cookbooks or I'll give you puppet modules, either one you want. Uh, but they'll both be pretty crappy in terms of like, is this a good, sane cookbook that you would actually want to deploy? So I would, I would say the short answer is no. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so when you're updating the configuration, is there a way to, for example, uh, in Drupal, they've got uh, maintenance mode when you're you know, upgrading your code or service, something like that. Sure. To be able to set that, do the upgrade, and then essentially unset that, is there a mechanism for that? Absolutely. So um, when using uh, the deploy resource, it has, uh, it's either the deploy resource or the application PHP cookbook will have these hooks. So you can do things like before the code update happens and then after the code update happens. So you could say before code update happens, write out this template file and that's going to be like your site disable thing, your maintenance mode page, and then do all your code updates and then after that's done, turn it back on remove that file or whatever. Yep. Great. Thanks. You bet. All right. Well, thank you all for coming out. I'll be around for a while and then I think we have like a half an hour before the like closing session. I have stickers and business cards up here. Uh, thanks again for coming out. <laughs>